Thanks very much for coming out uh, to the earlier sessions today. We really appreciate it. It's really wonderful to, to have you all here. Uh, my name is Stephen Klingman. I'm a professor in the English department and also director of the Interdisciplinary Studies Institute. Uh, and be, on behalf of the Institute um, and uh, the Department of Journalism with whom we've collaborated and the MFA program for poets and writers, I'd like to extend a most warm and cordial welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming out uh, and joining us for what I know will be a most meaningful and significant day. Um, I'll be saying a few words about the symposium today, uh, which started off last night with a, uh, a showing of the most extraordinary movie, Jim, um, the, uh, the, the James Foley story, and those of you who were there will know what a moving experience it was. And today we'll continue our considerations, I think, inspired by that movie. Um, but to begin with, it's my honor as well as my pleasure to call on the Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, Kumble R. Subhaswamy, to say a few words of welcome. Chancellor. Good morning. Did I do that? Good morning. On behalf of the entire university community, I thank all of you for being a part of this exploration of the uh, ups and downs and, and, and the importance and as well as the pitfalls of uh, the task of bearing witness to human deprivation and human atrocities. I'd like to extend an especially warm welcome to James Foley's parents, Diane and John Foley. Thank you for being here. Your presence here gives us comfort and strength. I would also like to offer a special welcome to all of James Foley's friends and colleagues who have joined us. It is a testimony to the nobleness of his mission and to his gifts and strengths that so many talented writers, journalists, poets, photographers, and friends are here today. We live in a time when violence and anarchy seem to be gaining dominance. We, we were reminded of this even as recently as just the past two days. Increasingly, for those of us who have the privilege of remaining a safe distance from the depths of the chaos, we may be tempted to turn away, turn a blind eye, turn a deaf ear. Or we may choose to watch, but keep our distance by observing through a lens of detachment or even cynicism. James Foley did neither. He chose to walk through the chaos and act as a witness to the deprivation. His insistence on telling the stories of the persecuted and the disadvantaged, the innocent trapped and suffering from the anarchy surrounding them, speaks not only to his courage, but also to a fundamental belief in humanity. He knew the risks to himself, but each time he filed a report on the atrocities he witnessed, he was making a statement of hope. Hope for the people he saw suffering and hope for his work, hope that his work would make a difference and hope for all of humanity. It is in great part that spirit of hope that we honor today. I did not have the privilege of knowing James Foley personally, but I'm exceedingly proud to be joined with him in this extended UMass community. Thank you all for being here. And again, I hope we have a really productive exploration through the symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor, uh, for those words. Uh, and before I go any further, I want to say uh, some other thank yous as well. First of all, to my uh, co-conspirator and collaborator in this, uh, Kathy Ford from the Department of Journalism. Kathy, um, my advice to anybody who wants to organize an event is do it with, with Kathy Ford in mind. Uh, and also to um, uh, someone who works closely with her, Beth Wallace. Beth, are you around somewhere? Um, manager of communication events and alumni relations in the Department of Journalism, uh, who put in an, an enormous amount of work. Uh, also to Noi Holland in the MFA program. Noi, are you here? Uh, yes. Who, uh, who helped us uh, envision this project in the early stages. 
and uh, not least my own assistants, Amanda Lagji and Bata Franerpa. Are they here? Are they Yes, both of you are here. Um, uh, my other advice is if you need assistance, uh, get Amanda and Vata to do it. They will, they will do everything and more. They read my mind. They do things before I even think of it. So I'm very grateful uh, to both of them. Um, I'm not going to list everyone uh, to whom we owe thanks. They are listed in the program, so please uh, read those names over there. Um, I do want to say, however, that we're very grateful to those who have funded us and who have co-sponsored this event including the Chancellor, the Provost, uh, Dean Julie Hayes. Uh, Julie, are you you're here somewhere? Yes. Uh, Julie, who helped inspire this event, so thank you very much for that. Um, also, Dean John Hurd from the uh, School of um, uh, uh, Social and Behavioral Sciences and the Dean of Commonwealth Honors College. But others funded us as well, and we're grateful to all of them. Um, and we're grateful, first and foremost, as Swami said, to Diane and John Foley, for their support for this event, for their presence, for their participation. It means more than we can say to have you here with us today. Uh, also, too, to Charles Sennett, a UMass alum, who worked closely with James Foley and without whom this event would not have been possible. We're grateful to all our participants and presenters, some of whom had to travel great distances or change their plans in order to be with us. And a warm welcome, too, to our former students, those friends and former colleagues of James Foley. Uh, you have come home to UMass. We hope it feels like your home. I hope you know that you're always welcome here. And so, to the matters at hand. How does one find words to respond to what happened to James Wright Foley, James Foley, Jim? What happened in August 2014 was his death but it was not, emphatically not, the whole of his life. Also, note the phrasing. To say what happened to James Foley is to use the passive voice. It may help us a bit in that it allows us to skirt around the topic. We don't have to confront things directly, consider the details. The passive voice, however, invokes what others did to Jim. But what was it that Jim did? What was it in his own life? that gave it richness and fullness and significance. One can term what happened to him a tragedy. Those of us who study such things will be familiar with Aristotle's definition. Tragedy is the story of a great man brought down by a tragic flaw. But having thought and read about Jim's life, I find in him no flaw at all. Nor was he brought down in that sense. As those, were imprisoned, those who were imprisoned with him testified, his presence brought light and hope to others and lifted them up. It always did. What happened to him was an outrage. It was an atrocity. That is a starting point. But what happened to Jim did not define his life. His life was something else. What it was, what its significance was, is the topic that concerns us today. When news came through in August 2014 of James Foley's death, there was grief on this campus as elsewhere. He was one of our own, our student. Especially for those who knew him, there was shock, a sense of terrible loss. The MFA program held a memorial, fairly private, for those who had known Jim. Yet the thought persisted that we wanted to do something more, things perhaps that one can only do with the passage of time. We wanted to reflect on James Foley, to think about his time here and in other places, to reflect on the extraordinary individual that had been our good fortune to have among us. We wanted to think about some of the larger resonances of his life, what his life meant and means to us, and what it means for many around the world. And so we have two aims at this symposium. One is to commemorate James Wright Foley, to remember who he was, the bright and shining person he was on this campus as elsewhere, to recall our thoughts and feelings, to make him live among us once again. And then there is our second purpose, to pay tribute to Jim by attending to the concerns and issues to which he dedicated his life, to make those issues and concerns live among us as well. Because surely that is one of the meanings of his life, that the problems to which he attended have not come to an end, 
but nor must the attention. They, these are things we need to think about. With Jim's example in front of us, that is what we intend to do. Those who knew Jim personally will speak about him. They will perhaps tell you more about some of the things we knew about him. How, when he was a student here, he volunteered at a local care center for unwed mothers, helping them to earn their GEDs. How he worked for Teach for America in Arizona, how he taught inmates in Chicago. How his life was wholly dedicated to helping others less fortunate than he was, specifically by giving them a voice. This underlay his work as a journalist in Afghanistan and Iraq, and then as a freelancer in Libya and Syria. His work lay in telling truths, reporting the stories, capturing the images and the voices that would otherwise go unheard, unseen. His was the task, and it is no easy task, of witnessing the title of our symposium today. And that is where Jim's life hands off to our own. That is where the significance of his life becomes our task. What is the task of witnessing today? How do we do it? How do we ask others to do it for us? How do we make sure they are safe in doing it? And if we ask them to report on atrocity for us, how do we as viewers, readers, citizens, witness and then act on what they have told us? But that is surely our responsibility as well. Witnessing does not occur only in the passive voice. It must and has to be a form of active engagement. And it must induce active engagement. Otherwise, we have tragedies of a different kind, tragedies of indifference, of neglect, of unconcern. And let us face it, this is a task we urgently need to do, for this is a very troubling world that confronts us, both at home and abroad. As we put it in our program notes, uh, for some time now, since 2001, if not before, we've been caught up in various forms of declared and undeclared war. Around the world, we face a baffling array of developments which are hard to contain in any coherent form of understanding. We live in a context of shifting boundaries, large-scale movements of people, strange mixtures of enmity and belief, the unnerving event, and its instant reproduction. What in these circumstances are the complex tasks of witnessing, of giving voice, of attempting to tell the truth? How do we see? How do we write? How do we report? How and where do we operate in the borderlands, both lived and conceptual, of encounter? What are the obligations of witnessing? What are the dangers? How do we give voice to the otherwise unreported, to the unknown, to those whose voices would go otherwise unheard? How do we, and as readers and viewers, witness atrocity? What, in short, are the tasks and perils of witnessing in our current world? Jim Foley was concerned. From what I understand of him, Jim Foley also had joy, deep joy in his being and in his life. He had depth. He found what he wanted to do, what gave him meaning in the world. From my distance, I would say he was a seeker, always looking for ways to give his life meaning. For him, it came through the task of witnessing. This symposium is now our task of witnessing, to take up the task that he has handed on. To this end, we have poets, writers, photographers, journalists, and members of James Foley's families who have spoken and will speak. We might think of this as a somber occasion, but though one aspect of the story is certainly somber, let us discover life and Jim's life, the life that he continues to have among us in our considerations and in our concerns today. Thank you very much. And now to start us off, I'm going to call on my colleague, the esteemed poet, Martina Spada, to set us thinking about the person at the heart of our concerns and considerations today. Martine. Thank you very much. 
Um, I would like to uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Klingman, Professor Ford, um, Chancellor. I want to add my welcome to John and Diane Foley, to Jim's friends and colleagues here this morning. Jim Foley was my student. I was uh, on his MFA thesis committee. He took my classes. And we had long talks in my office at Bartlett Hall. I discovered quickly that he was a person of principle who sought to live his life based on that principle, to act on that principle. Jim was very interested in the Latino community. He spoke Spanish. He had taught with the Teach for America program in the Barrios of Phoenix. And so I referred him to the care center. Now, uh, the care center is a high school equivalency and alternative education program for adolescent mothers, mostly Puerto Rican, in Holyoke, not far from here. And the care center hired him. And from 2002 to 2004, Jim taught English to Spanish speakers there. He also taught poetry. And that is the background for the poem I'm about to read. For a long time, I didn't think I could write a poem about Jim Foley. I just couldn't do it. And then Yago Cura, one of Jim's closest friends, decided to edit and publish an anthology of poems about Jim called Guzzles for Foley. So I want to extend my thanks to Yago also. He's right over there. Here's the poem now. And um, indeed, it's called Guzzle for a Tall Boy from New Hampshire for Jim Foley, journalist beheaded on video by ISIS August 19th, 2014. The reporters called and asked me, did you know him? I was his teacher, I said many times that day. Yes, I knew him. Once he was a teacher too, teaching in another mill town where the mills had disappeared. There they knew him. He taught the refugees from an island where the landlords left them nothing but their hands. In Spanish, they knew him. They sounded out the English, made the crippled letters walk across the page for him, all because they knew him. He ate their rice and beans, held their infants, posed with them for snapshots at the graduation, asked them how they knew him. Belisa, Monica, Limari. With him, they wrote a poem of waterfalls and frogs that sing at night so he could know them as they knew him. We know his words turned to rain in the rainforest of the poem. We cannot say what words are his, even though we knew him. His face on the front page sold the newspapers in the checkout line. His executioners and his president spoke of him as if they knew him. The reporter with the camera asked me if I saw the video his killers wanted us to see. I muttered through a cage of teeth, no, I knew him. Once, he was a tall boy from New Hampshire standing in my doorway. He spoke Spanish. He wanted to teach. I knew him. I never knew him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you, uh, Chancellor. Uh, again, a welcome to all. We will now move into our first panel for the day, 
which will take a few minutes just to set up. Uh, so uh, bear with us, get a breath, uh, take a sip of water, and we will get this going as, as soon as we can. Uh, a panel with Sabina Murray, uh, Marza Mengiste, uh, Mengiste and uh, uh, Diana Matar. So um, we'll, we should be up and running soon, I hope. Okay, thank you. <laughs>